Hello everyone, this is Super Comic Girl. So I'm redoing this video because I had forgotten the name of the documentary I had watched, which is pretty bad. Uh, so this is Boiled Angels, The Trial of Mike, Diana, and um, yes, and people can have last names that sound like first names. For people who may think that's impossible, it is actually possible. So, um, so I was on watch uh, Mojo and they were talking about these banned books and comics and stuff like that. And when I heard about um, Boiled Angels, I was like, okay, that's really weird. And so I actually typed it up and they actually did documentary way back in 2018. So I am several years uh, past it, but they did a documentary and um, I was watching it because I, I paid the two ninety nine. Not not no. Yeah, it was two ninety nine. Uh, you can have high def. You can have standard def. I always choose standard def because every time I try to buy in high def, the, the system says sorry, you don't have the right stuff for high def. You have to do standard def. Sorry, you don't get the goodness. So anyways, um, so I paid for it from Amazon, and. Um, and so uh, the the story was basically it was it, this. So for people that may not know this, and I hate I hate cutting my own sentences off. This trial actually happened, or this whole thing actually happened around the time of the Gainesville murders, and my family was living down in Florida uh, during that time, but. I had never heard of of this guy at all. Now I had heard that there was a guy that had gotten was um, you know was being investigated as a possible Gainesville killer, but I had totally forgotten his name, and apparently it was him. So yes, <laughs> so apparently he was so uninteresting that I totally forgot his name. So. He wasn't, he didn't go to trial as the possible Gainesville killer. He went to trial over Florida's Anti-Obscenity Act. Now, for people that have lived in Florida at any measure of their lives, you know that Florida has some really weird and strange laws. There was a thing back in the early 2000s. I totally forgot the woman's name. But she had relations with a much younger girl. She was like 18. She was having relations with this really much younger girl. And everybody felt sorry for her. But this one guy got like I think 110, 115 years for having relations with his own girlfriend. This is Florida for you. Everything is messed up. Um, and his mother was very angry that, oh, you didn't support the fact that my son is in prison for the rest of his life for having relations with his one year apart girlfriend, but you support this girl who had it was it, it was a messy thing. It's been forgotten in the annals of history and all that type of stuff. But it was one messy, messy thing. And I commented several times, Florida has weird laws. So this was one of those weird laws that we're going to talk about in this video. So let's go way, way back. And I did a video a couple of months ago about the history of the Comic Code Authority. So, uh, if you guys did not catch that nearly hour-long video, which uh, is, uh, yeah, my aunts, now this is, comes from my uncle, and he keeps a careful record of who married who and who they were related to and all that jazz. He does his own little genealogy thing, which I thought was really cool because he has it all written down. So, if we ever want to know the history of our really weird family, we just go there and go, yeah, this guy owned this and this woman had 11 children and whatever. So, for people who may not know this, and my uncle keeps damn good records, 
my aunt's ex-husband's brother was the cre was the head of EC Comics. And for people that do not know, EC Comics did a lot of horror and science fiction. They also created Mad Magazine, which was the only thing that survived what I would call the purge. So one of the things that was leveled against companies like the one that my aunt's ex-husband's brother or yeah, brother, um, uh, what did, <clears throat> was, was that comic books cause juvenile delinquency. It basically turned, basically in a nutshell, it turns kids into killers and rapists and all that type of stuff. They tried everything to stay in, stay afloat. Unfortunately, they could not because vendors would not buy comics unless they had the Comic Code Authority seal. So in the 90s, during what, what is known as the Satanic Panic, um, there, this guy goes and creates a, um, a Zen comic called Boiled Angels. And this thing was very graphic wasn't really drawn that well, not super well, but it did have, he did have the ability to draw. And basically, Florida's Anti-Obscenity Act, which does fly in the face of the First Amendment because it can be abused for all, you know, you can, you can take somebody's First Amendment rights and say, yeah, well, because it, because you're drawing stuff we don't like and we think is obscene, your First Amendment rights are not, do not, are not present. You don't have First Amendment rights. So Neil Gaiman, who was actually in the documentary, said that one of the things that he really loves about living in America is the idea of the First Amendment. And for a lot, and he actually thought that his art, his comics, was protected under the First Amendment. He was actually found guilty of three counts of violating uh, Florida's Anti-Obscenity Act. He was, th he was sentenced to three years in prison. Oh, actually, he was given three years probation. He had to do community service. He had to hold, a, hold down a full-time job. He couldn't draw in his own home. He couldn't, perch he couldn't really have art supplies. This was a complete curtail of the First Amendment. You, you can't even draw in your own home, which was stupid. So, um, yeah. So, the thing was, at the time that this happened, comic books had really started leaving the purview of children and of young boys. Now you had adults that were, like, they were reading fucking Spawn, for God's sake. Um, and Spawn had a lot of violence, but because, of course, it was owned by Todd McFarlane, who had a lot of money to defend his work in court, um, they left Spawn alone. But adults just couldn't wrap their minds that comic books had become, had you had adults reading them. You had adults that had been children when the Comic Code Authority had been developed because they wanted to govern themselves. So they, so he reached out to the legal, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, I think it is, and they sent a lawyer. And this lawyer was a big, big defender of the First Amendment. He talks about a project that he did when he was in second grade that led him to being expelled and all that stuff. So what, so the commentary, the guy that was doing it, he was really like corny and cheesy and not like you would see of a, of a guy that actually could do commentary, which makes him very different than say other ones. And, uh, but 
in the end, it did successfully tell this story of this guy when he was 18, 19 years old, where he was prosecuted um, under Florida's Anti-Obscenity Act. And he actually, he couldn't stand Florida. He, couldn't st he was being suffocated in Florida. He couldn't draw out of fear the police would bang on his door and knock it down and see, oh, oh my God, you got a pink pencil, um, you know, and that type of stuff. So he left Florida and went to New York. And when Florida found out that he basically left without telling them, they tried to get him extradited from New York back to Florida to go, apparently to go to prison. And New York's like, uh, no, no. All they did was remind him that you're $100 behind on your fines. Oh, blah. Oh, are you drawing? I mean, New York didn't care. New York didn't give a shit. They had other stuff. They had, like, they had real stuff going on. They were like, oh, my God, we need to call him up and see if he's, like, drawing. No, they didn't. They, they, had, they had what? They had, like, I think in the 90s, they still had the mob. I mean, they had freaking people overdosing on heroin and snorting cocaine in their backyards. I mean, seriously, they didn't give a damn about some guy who did a comic book. But, you know, and I think his probation officer left. <laughs> was like, I don't not do this no more. Um, but what ended up happening was the creators of the documentary ended up paying all of his legal fees and his court costs and he ended up being free, so he can go back to Florida. He, I think he went to Florida for a little bit to be kind of like... Um, but, um, of course, you know, he gained a lot more of a following um, just by going to be, being, you know, hit with this. But like I said, it was during the Satanic Panic. And I don't think it any... I don't think if someone try to bring something like this in the early 2000s, it would even see, like, trial. They'd be laughing at you, like, really, really? You have you seen this stuff on the internet? So, really, anti-obscenity laws are never prosecuted. I mean, violations of anti-obscenity laws... They're not prosecuted anymore. They're not even looked at. I think it's a defunct law now um, because really with the internet and with internet porn and all that type of stuff, then yeah, I mean, you got OnlyFans, you know, which is worse. <laughs> That's my brother. Um, but yes, Boiled Angels was shocking and he did address a lot of things that was going on. Um, like, you know, child, you know, molestation by priests, um, you know, being, you know, uh, uh, definitely like, you know, religion and everything. And this was all based on things that he had seen when he was younger with all, you know, it coming out that priests were molesting children. Uh, that came out, um, his exposure to all these different things that were coming out during that time. And, of course, his love for horror. Um, and, you know, he said in the documentary that he had loved horror for years. And he actually got his own video membership where he could go and he could watch all the horror that he wanted um, but just the attack on First Amendment rights and the fact the Supreme Court did not want to hear it uh, either says that they weren't really in the mood to take a case like this where you had a guy that really shocked the shit out of people, which I think society in a whole needs to be shocked. Just an idea. Um, it also, I think, really showed, um, really, I think, what the justices believed in. Uh, that's my own personal opinion. But thankfully, the man is freed now. Um, he doesn't have to worry about being extradited. Uh, but no state is going to extradite nobody from to Florida for, oh yeah, you wrote a, you did a comic book. 
Oh my god, we need to extradite you back to Florida. So, no. no, Nobody cared about Florida. Nobody had respect for Florida. But, you know, if you got New York that won't extradite somebody to Florida for because they drew an obscene, supposedly an obscene comic, really shows that um, we as New Yorkers think that your anti-obscenity law is stupid. That is literally what, literally how they viewed it as. It's like, just you just imagine him like, drawing oh my god I'm violating my probation I'm drawing and then like are you drawing no I'm not doing nothing of the sort <laughs> he's drawing but yeah and ended up um there was a book that he did called America um that had a had a you know a, um a member and then it had like the American flag coming out I thought that was an interesting uh, cover choice, um, and really, um, you know, it's a, uh, it, it really just, like I said, it just shows you how, how bad, you know, it was, and how, you know, people that would normally be protected under the First Amendment, um, were basically put on trial, found guilty, um, even the prosecutor thought, why are we taking a five-minute recess in the middle of closing arguments? Nobody does that unless you know for certain by doing that you're going to secure that the jury is going to find the person guilty. No, not even the O.J. Simpson case did they ever do a five-minute recess in the middle of closing arguments. No judge does that. And then they talked about, you know, they did this and this, uh, doing this particular act that's considered un considered unethical. They wanted to ensure that there was no way that he could ever escape their clutches. But thankfully, thankfully, um, the producers of the documentary, they paid all his legal fees and court costs, and he was able to be freed of this horrible period of his life. Even his parents couldn't believe that his First Amendment rights were being violated I mean, there was just so much shady stuff going on in the 90s as far as law was concerned. And, um, yeah. So, um, I did enjoy the documentary a lot. I love documentaries. Um, I, you know, that's the thing. is documentaries that make you smarter and they open your eyes to things that you may have been, you may have been around in that particular place at that time, but you probably had forgotten about it helps you remember that, helps you appreciate how things are now and be glad you're not at that particular time period of your life again. So I give it five stars. It was really great. You had all these different people that were talking about it. And um, yeah, so glad he doesn't have to worry about being arrested and all that. And kudos to New York for not agreeing to extradite him back to uh, Florida. So um, yeah. I will see you guys around until next time. Nerds, keep reading. Bye.